conversation with author, composer, producer, scholar, interviewer, and Madison music legend Ben Sidron this morning on For the Record. Good morning, I'm Neil Heinen. Ben Sidron has a relatively new album out, if the word album still means anything today. It does to me. His 31st album, Don't Cry for No Hipster, and we'll talk about that a little later. But about a year and a half ago, Ben also published his fourth book, There Was a Fire, Jews, Music, and the American Dream, and it is an extraordinary piece of work. I've been looking forward to having the opportunity to talk with Ben about the book and its impact, and I welcome to For the Record this morning, Ben Sidron. Ben, thanks a lot. Thanks, Neil. Pleasure. You know, I, I, I don't do this a lot, but I kind of want to just to give a little context to this book from my perspective. I, it, it was really interesting as a, as a history, um, stories, uh, and, and, and artists, you know, that I, that I revered, you know, Mike Bloomfield and Donald Fagan. Uh, but, but as I, as I wrote in, in the piece I wrote in Madison Magazine in December, it was much, much deeper in, in, in a lot of ways. And I saw on, on YouTube, you mentioned it took you eight years to write that book, and it's one of the hardest things that you ever did. And I, and I believe it. Start just talking about the process and what became There Was a Fire. Well, like all the work I do, it was very personal, and I stumbled into it. I mean, I tend to just get an idea and follow it till I run it to ground. And what happened was in 2002 or three, I was the artist in residence here at the university. Yeah. And I proposed a course that was essentially what became the book, which was uh, Jewish popular music in America from Irving Berlin to Lenny Kravitz. That's what I thought we'd talk about. What is Jewish about this contribution? Not just the writers and the singers, but the whole Jewish experience, the executives, the agents, the promoters, whatever. Because when you look at it, the Jews only make up 2% of the population, and yet, conceivably, 70, 80% of the folks in the popular music business have some connection to the Jewish tradition. So that's what started me on this. And after I gathered up enough material to teach the course, I realized I had to really get into this, that this was an interesting book, that I had done the initial preparation, and I had to really get serious about it. So it took about four years to read all the material, and I mean, I spent one year reading on monotheism, who is a Jew, because mm -hmm. before I could write the book, I had to feel comfortable with the, how you answer that, or what is Jewish about American popular music. I, it, it, that took some time. And then another uh, three years to write it, the first year throwing myself on the bed and saying, I can't do it, and the other two <laughs> years actually doing it. Right, right, right. I mean, did, did you know where you were going to look for source material for this, or did you continually discover it as you went through the process? No, I was discovering it. I really had no idea uh, what I was getting into. Uh, you know, I was thinking about Irving Berlin. I had to read everything I could find on Irving Berlin and go on the internet and listen to all the stuff. The same thing with Gershwin or Harold Arland. I mean, I ran everything to ground that I could possibly do. How much of this was in you, either recognized or not recognized throughout, throughout your career? How much did Jewishness influence your career? Well, that's a question that would have a different answer depending on uh, at what stage of my life it was asked. Right. And now, my answer would be, well, I think it was profound. I think that my earliest musical slash jazz experiences probably included uh, going to the synagogue on Saturday morning with my father and listening to these old men davening and swaying. And there was something hypnotic about it, and it was the same hypnotic uh, kind of haunted atmosphere that I found in jazz. So they, those two experiences were connected for me. But uh, at age 18 through age 40, I would think that my response would have been very little. You know, my, the Jewish upbringing had very little to do with my life as a jazz musician. Although when I got into the research, one thing I discovered is that when they asked Irving Berlin, Mr. Berlin, what does uh, being a Jew have to do with your great success? He said, absolutely nothing. I'm an American. They asked George Gershwin the same thing. He said, nothing, I, I write the American opera. So the most typical Jewish response in America usually is, being a Jew has nothing to do with it. So I think I was quite typical until uh, 
the early 90s when my son was old enough to have some Jewish experience and I started going back and looking into it. And, and I mean, from, what you, from, from your research, you would dispute Gershwin and, and, and Irving Berlin, that, that Jewishness had nothing to do with it. Jewish, Jewishness has everything to yeah, do with it. Yeah, yeah. Everything yeah. to do with it. And uh, this was uh, one of the things that took a long time to articulate. Uh, but one thing that really uh, opened it up for me was the story of Emma Lazarus. You know, we're t I was thinking about the Jews in the 19th century, how they came in great numbers from the 1880s on because of the great uh, pogroms that were raging in the Pale of Settlement in Eastern Europe. And over a course of 20 some years, there were two million Jews who showed up from uh, Eastern Europe, essentially into Manhattan. And uh, they spoke Yiddish primarily, a combination of Hebrew and German. Uh, and they had to start from scratch and become Americans. And so the thought was, what is it about the American dream that not only resonated with the Jews, but was created by the Jews? And the poem on the Statue of Liberty, the famous, sure. give me your tired and yeah. your hungry and your tempest tossed. Uh, and well, Emma Lazarus was a Jewish girl who was really in New York high society, but when she saw these thousands and thousands of Jewish refugees washing up on the shores of Manhattan, it struck a chord in her. And I think perhaps uh, she thought something to the effect of there, but for the grace of God go I. And so she articulated what became the American dream. Up until that time, the American dream was not about social justice. You know, uh, the, uh, for example, uh, you, in America in the 19th century, generally speaking, you couldn't vote if you were a woman. You couldn't vote if uh, you were black. Right. Uh, you couldn't uh, vote if you didn't own property. Right. The American dream was about property. Yep. So the Jews, as they came, articulated what we now consider to be part of the social justice package of what America wants to give to the world. And that's a Jewish thing. And the, the book gives the sense, though, that it, it, it isn't so much individuals who articulated that, but as you put it, the inner voice of our collective self mm. is the Jewish definition of music. And there's something about that collectiveness mm -hmm. that feels important. Well, a absolutely. The, um, the Jewish experience, you know, I think goes back much longer than the a Abrahamic tradition. I mean, we like to think that 4,000 years ago, maybe there was a man named Abraham who went walking in the desert, heard a voice, the voice said, follow me, et cetera, et cetera. But that's clearly apocryphal. I mean, between you and myself, if God actually spoke to Abraham, that was truly a miracle. And my thought is, well, if God didn't actually speak to Abraham, if in fact that's a story, just an apocryphal story, then maybe it's a, even a greater miracle that a story, a narrative, could move so much history. And I think that as Joseph Campbell, the, the lecturer, sure. said many times that people need a greater story. They need a, great, a myth so that they can feel part, that they can be contextualized as people. And I think that that's what the story of monotheism does. I think that's what the Jewish story does. It contextualizes us as people. So, as I'd like to say, individually we are notes. Together we're music, we're a symphony. And without the collective aspect, I don't think we really exist the way we exist. I think the analogy to black music is probably unavoidable, and I want to come back and talk about that when we come back right after this. I'm back with Ben Sidron, and we were talking about his most recent book, There Was a Fire, Jews, Music, and the American Dream. And I, I mentioned the, the African-American experience, and, and, and it, it does it, is there an analogy there? I mean, you, you spend a lot of time with it in the book, but help us understand how that, how that compares to, the, to, to the, the Jewish tradition. Well, you know, uh, 
By saying that there's a comparison, it implies A and B, and I tend to think more and more now that the Jewish experience and the African experience uh, are grounded in the same uh, immigrant circumstances in as much as when you think about it, African Americans are really true Americans and the earliest true Americans. Their uh, roots in America go back uh, as far as any pilgrim roots. And now you have the Jews who come much later, hundreds of years later, and on the one hand, when the Jews got here in the 1880s, 1890s, being a Jew, uh, you were not considered white. You were considered a person of color. Uh, being Jewish was very much a part of uh, this theory of eugenics, which had to do with race. Uh, today, I think most people understand that uh, there's a human race and everything else is local color. But back then, Jews and uh, blacks in America uh, were on this very uh, specific spectrum. And uh, likewise, uh, Jews and African Americans both had this uh, narrative of slavery in their histories. Now, because the African American culture was an oral culture, they had no framing story or narrative to what happened to them in slavery. But the Jews, being a literate culture, had a tremendous framing narrative for slavery and the delivering aspect of crossing the River Jordan and, and survival. And so that narrative that was initially part of uh, the Bible that was uh, given to uh, uh, the slaves became very important because a lot of the development of, of black culture in America came out of the church. So what you have is you have this symbiotic relationship of proto-Americans, uh, of people on the outside, of people who, uh, well, even though the uh, Jewish tradition is a very literate tradition, initially for four or 500 years, that story was not written down, even though there was written language. It was kept as kind of a magic song. So this idea that uh, music exists in the words and words exist in the music, that there is some understanding that happens when people come together in music that is quite different from the Western classical tradition. Yeah. This, um, uh, uh, this broadened um, in, in, in the Jewish experience beyond just performing to a, a pretty significant impact on the industry. What, what, what do we need to know about that, Ben? Why is that, why is that significant, that producers, label executives, I mean... Uh, uh, well, the first and most obvious answer is, look, uh, the Jews were not allowed into any of the white shoe businesses, lawyers, uh, medical school, a lot of that stuff, uh, for quite some time. Uh, the University of Wisconsin itself uh, had quotas uh, up until very recently, and probably still does in some veiled way. Uh, similarly, uh, in any of the big legitimate businesses in the United States, Jews were really not welcome. So initially, show business, entertainment, was a business you could get into. Likewise, music publishing. Uh, music publishing really wasn't much of a business until the turn of the century. And I like to recount the story of Stephen Foster, our, the greatest American composer in the sure. 19th century, who died flat broke with 35 cents in his pocket. Yeah. And the reason is he couldn't collect royalties on Oh Susanna and uh, Camp Town Races. And the reason he couldn't collect royalties is there was no publishing business to speak of except for religious music, and the reason there was no publishing business to speak of is the Jews had not come and started it yet. So uh, there's this uh, kind of uh, through line uh, of opportunity. That's the first thing. But the second thing, and this is very interesting, and it's a bit of a shaggy dog story, but I'll try to compress it. Uh, when the Jews came to America, you know, they were known for being in the rag business. Uh, the rag business really is the, the needle uh, business, uh, repairing old clothes. Why were they adept at uh, repairing old clothes? Because back in the Pale of Settlement, they weren't allowed to sell new clothes, right? So they became adept at being tailors. Mm -hmm. They come to the United States and they become tailors. And you see pictures of the Jews on the Lower East Side carrying sewing machines sure. around with them, right? So it's the confluence of technology, the sewing machine, and uh, the necessity you have to do something. Well, the Jews, within a decade, invented exact size clothing. That is, they democratized 
clothing just by virtue of the fact that they had this skill. Up until then, if you wanted to look good, you had to be able to afford a tailor. Once the Jewish influence on the fashion business showed up, everybody could afford to look good. So there was a democratizing aspect to the Jewish experience anyway. Well, a lot of these tailors, you know, eventually uh, became retailers and eventually started moving Nickelodeons into their retail outlets and eventually these little movies became so popular they got the clothes out and they started theater chains and this is how Lowe's happened and this is how Hollywood happened. So it's, the, it's an evolution of opportunity with an underlying backstory of give the people what they want. Yep. Um, all right, when we come back I wanna just pick a couple of stories about musicians and we'll talk a little bit about music when we come back right after this. My guest this morning is Ben Sidron, and we are talking about his book, There Was a Fire, Jews, Music, and the American Dream. I think I'm right. The, 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 the best place to get the book is at bensidron.com. Yes. I mean, your music is available there. Your books are available there. Absolutely. It's also available at on Amazon and, and, and Amazon, other locations. And you but can get it on... Uh, it's a mystery to me on uh, Monroe Street and good. University Bookstore. Yeah, great. Um, but BenSidron.com is, 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 is a great place to yeah, great place to go. Um, we don't have time for, for for all the stories there, but you know Gershwin, Artie Shaw, and, and as I mentioned, Mike Bloomfield and Donald mm. Fagan and Bob Dylan. Mm. I mean, pick one or two, Ben, and help us understand how we how we understand Jewish music better through those stories? Well, let me go back even further because I think in some ways the prototypical uh, story is the Louis Armstrong story. Uh -huh. You know, the apocryphal uh, received wisdom about Louis Armstrong is here was this little African-American orphan standing on the corner. Eventually he was taken to an orphanage where he was given his first horn. He became a trumpet player with the Little Orphans Band and eventually grew up to be the father of jazz. Yep. Uh, it's a beautiful story, it is not true. The fact is that Louis Armstrong, as a young boy, was taken in by a Jewish family, the Karnofskys, who had a junk wagon. And he would go with Mr. Karnofsky and his son around uh, to sell uh, their wares. And the first horn he ever played was a little tin horn to attract customers to the Karnofsky ju uh, junk wagon. And eventually they found a, a horn in a junk store and purchased it for him. And, and so uh, there's that. But even beyond that, Armstrong says that the first music he heard was listening to Mrs. Karnofsky sing Russian lullabies to put the baby to bed. And that that was his primary motivation. Yeah. So here you see this profound connection between blacks and Jews. Yep. And that connection is the story of American popular culture in the 20th century. It doesn't matter what point you put your finger down. If you put your finger down on Gershwin, if you put your finger down on Harold Arlen, if you put your finger down on uh, Donald Fagan or Bob Dylan, yep. there's a connection. And we can unravel each one specifically, but basically uh, this connection um, is at the heart of what American popular music is all about. Yeah, that's, that, that, it's a it's a great example. Um, when did the when did your Dylan um, when did you release your Dylan CD? Uh, Two thousand ten. Okay, so so uh, don't cry for no hipster is the first CD after this book. That's right. Um, that clearly was a, is, a, is a very important piece of work for you. Yeah. Uh, that uh, and it, it and yeah. I think you've said it's very personal. Uh, the YouTube stuff is great with Leo and, and, and the band. Um, did, did the book influence your thinking about, about this well, th record? Well, there's, there's no question that the record was a result of writing the book, but in a way I couldn't have anticipated, and that is the book was so difficult. I was so focused on the book, and toward the end, I mean, I was working six, seven hours a day, you know. Yeah. When it was done and when it was completed, I actually had no intention of ever doing anything ever again. <laughs> you know, I thought I was going to sail off. And uh, I was sitting at my little electric piano, just fooling around, and I came up with this the song. The first song was called Private Guy. It just came out, really. And Leo was there. And Leo said, gee, that's a good song. Why don't you keep writing? 
the next song I wrote was Don't Cry For No Hipster, and he said, you've got a theme here. Keep going. And I found that it was easier to write than all 31 albums, 30 albums that came before it. Something was happening. You could say to me, let's go to the store, and I'd write you a song called Let's Go To The Store. Sure. It was my mind was just flowing. So I wrote all the 12 original songs on Don't Cry For No Hipster in a period of two months. And I, when I look back at them, I saw that it was the most autobiographical, the most simply confessional music that I'd ever come upon. And the secret was I wasn't trying to do anything. Yeah. I was just letting the stories come out. We just have two minutes left, and, uh, and I want to ask you the, the, the question that struck me so much about this book, and it's the word memory, Ben. Memory feels like perhaps one of the most important themes in that book. How, how do you describe that? Well, it is, and I think uh, one of the things about uh, the Internet age that we're in is that there's a lot of information but very little memory. I mean, there's memory in the computer and you can store it, but memory in terms of feeling something. Because, you know, uh, my good friend Richie Davidson talks about uh, memory, and he says there are two kinds of memory. There's the uh, subjective memory, which is I remember going and getting in the car and turning the key and stuff. Invariably, it's inaccurate. We keep changing as we go. And then there's the emotional memory, and the emotional memory is the true memory. What did you feel like? What does it feel like? How did it shape you? Because we're shaped by our emotions, not our, our brilliant ideas. Yeah. And so this idea of memory was a very important uh, concept in the Jewish tradition. Very important. Yeah. As a matter of fact, the book is called There Was a Fire, because in the book there's a story about the importance of memory to the Jews. Yeah. And I feel that that book is my contribution to the popular memory. I think it's a really important book. Congratulations. Thanks, Neil. BenSidrin.com is where you can find it. And happy birthday. Thank you. 70. That's outstanding today. We'll come back and wrap up for the record right after this. Ah, uh, 70, man. My thanks to Ben Sidrin for being here this morning. Betsy Barhorst has left the building. We'll visit with the retired Madison College president about her tenure on next week's For the Record. Until then, have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.